present with me um, for this hour. Um, I'm very grateful for that and for your presence, and I appreciate it. Um, this is a vast topic and it's an ancient craft. So I created a presentation for people that are interested in bees and potentially beekeeping. Um, and of course I, it had to be um, like narrowed in and specified because I, I can't explain everything. Um, but I encourage you to go on after this and research and get in touch with me if you want. And I hope in the meantime that you learn something new and have a little fun. Um, I am Bianca Brayman and uh, Arissa just told you where I'm from and everything. Um, but I'm a commercial beekeeper in Northern New York and Northern Vermont. I'm gonna begin with my personal journey um, because my story um, and how I got to where I am, it, it feels good. It feels like a good way to, a good path to get into beekeeping if you're interested in doing so. Um, so I began by first reading and researching. Um, I, I first read First Lessons in Beekeeping by Dada, which is fe featured here. Um, and I highly recommend that as a first beekeeping book. Uh, it's been revised several times for, for the years. The one that I read was old, but still super relevant, um, which is the case with a lot of beekeeping um, uh, books and, and such. I then, you know, went into the YouTube video uh, holes and, and it piqued my interest. So I went to the farmer's market and introduced myself to Dick Crawford the guy in the middle holding the B frame there. And he told me about the local club, the Champlain Valley Beekeepers Association. And he told me that they were meeting that Saturday and it was Tuesday. And he said, if you can get a bee suit, I highly recommend it, but you should totally show up. So I did. And I absolutely loved it. Um, I, I was so dorky and the people were so wonderful and welcoming and I still have friends from that club and I'm still part of the club. Um, it was a wonderful thing to become a part of and uh, and I spent one year in the club without having any bees at all. So one year researching, one year in the club researching still. Highly recommend that process. And then got two colonies of my own. Uh, at the time I um, was working three jobs, but somehow still very broke. So I didn't, I couldn't afford two really great nucleus colonies. So I got two semi-good nucleus colonies and combined them to make one um, because one of them was failing miserably, which is pictured here. Um, so I got them through the winter and I still have that colony of bees, actually. Uh, they have a different queen, but they are still kicking and I love that. <laughs> um, so after that winter, I went to the spring meeting and in the, sp in the spring we have a featured speaker who is a seasoned beekeeper and it was Mike. Um, and if any of you know Mike, you know that he is one of the world's best. He's just wonderful. He has enormous, enormous breadth of knowledge um, I loved his teaching style, and so with, with some kind of confidence, I don't know where it came from, I approached him after his, his talk and asked him if he ever needed an extra pair of newbie hands, and he said, sure. <laughs> um, so I called him in May, and he said, you can come tomorrow, and somehow I found my way there, and when I arrived, he very kindly taught me, and this is a picture from that day actually, he very kindly taught me how to make cardboard nuke boxes. And so um, these are boxes that are created for colonies that we sell to people. Um, and he uses waxed cardboard ones, which I love that he does that, because um, you can use uh, plastic and oftentimes they don't get reused, so it's kind of a waste. So these are nice and you can reuse them because they're waxed. Um, and he taught me how to put them together and uh, and he, then after that he paired me up with Kate uh, who I still work with and she is wonderful. Uh, she, she gave me the most patience and care and overall it was just a wonderful day and I kept going back and volunteering. 
And so this is a really great way that you can get involved with someone that you feel you don't, you don't deserve that space or time with is just offering them a hand. Um, and, and Mike is gracious and he takes the hand, even though it might actually make it harder for him. <laughs> he loves to teach and he's, he's a wonderful person. So I'm just, I was just so lucky to be there. Um, and, and I highly recommend that, that process as well. So in the meantime, I was waitressing, cleaning rooms, farming, and becoming obsessed with beekeeping, driving to two hours plus to Vermont and Northern New York to meet up with Mike and his crew. And Tucka, another woman who was working for Mike, uh, was letting me come along with her and help her out with her war a hives it's a totally different style than mike and so i just realized that i was totally into this it didn't matter what way it was i wanted to be surrounded by bees i developed such a relationship with them and such a care that i knew i wanted to be a commercial beekeeper and do this every day um it was so meaningful to me that i was able to connect with other women so quickly uh, there i mean i i'm supposed to say this later but there over two-thirds of the the u.s beekeepers are men so it's kind of wild that i was able to connect with with so many women um mike is a, a super cool and gentle spirit i don't know if that's why i'm not sure why but women work for him and he's and and it's wonderful so um got to meet tucka and then I, you know, I realized how lucky I was to be volunteering with Mike and knew that, that he was probably never going to hire me. So I applied for beekeeping jobs all over the country in that summer. I just knew I wanted to try it. I applied for a migratory beekeeping position with Barkman Honey, which is like those big pumps at Starbucks, like mass produced honey, 24,000 colonies I think they have. I applied for packaging out in California, another migratory beekeeping or pollinating pollinator position in California. And I got hired with my reference for volunteering for Mike by Barkman Honey. So I called Mike and I said, hey Mike, what should I do? And he said, forget it, come work for us. And that absolutely made my life, <laughs> of course. So I did. Um, and here's another dorky picture of me. <laughs> um, I spent four days a week working for Mike that the rest of that summer and sleeping in my car, camping out of my car. Uh, I did not have enough money to, or, you know, resources at all to get like an apartment or in two different places or, um, to get a hotel room or anything like that. So I figured it out out of my car, set up a tent, cooked on a little tiny, uh, like, Bunsen burner style stove, um, MSR, whatever it is. Uh, and, um, and I had a wonderful time. Like I look back on that time in my life with, with utmost fondness and I, I loved it. I, uh, I, uh, was still waitressing, uh, two to three days a week. So I was working six or seven days a week. Uh, so I would return to ne camp out in ne Vermont, return to New York, waitress and back to Vermont again and studying the whole time, reading as much as I could about bees. That winter, I realized that I would need something to do outside, so I joined Ski Patrol. It was a wonderful experience, fit perfectly with my schedule, and just another total like dive, but it was awesome. The, the community there was, was wonderful as well, so glad I did it and highly recommend. Um, and in the spring, I returned to farming and cleaning again and committed three days to Mike. So back into car camping and, and uh, cooking out of my car, and it was awesome. Um, and I absolutely loved it. I was really tired living in two different worlds, and sometimes it felt like I was like a ghost version of myself, but I was very, I'm once again, very fond of that time. My car turned into kind of like my snail shell. I just sort of realized that this was something that I was just falling in love with. And I saw circles everywhere, hilarious with the sunflowers. Um, this is near one of the yards where I work, but uh, 
the, there's a symbiotic relationship between the bees and the plants. So being able to work with this wonderful woman, um, Megan Kirkpatrick at the Bark Eater, who's an herbalist, and uh, being able to work with her beautiful garden and her beautiful plants and herbs and going to Vermont and working with the bees and putting it all together and understanding how it worked together and then having my bees at Megan's and it just was really cool to see all of it working in the same place. Um, and I knew I was in the right place. I started that spring, I started more colonies in the Adirondacks. I experienced my first big mistake. I um, didn't put up an electric fence because I didn't think I needed one. Had a major bear attack on a colony that was doing super, super well. Um, as you can see that bear paw in the right hand corner of the picture on that box, um, that's furthest right, cr like crazy. Yeah, I bet. But they were still alive, so I put them back together at Megan's, um, and they did they did incredibly well. That's the same colony as the first colony I showed you. Um, I still have them. They're out in my yard right here, um, and they survived it, and they made over 100 pounds of honey, which is totally awesome. So after that, um, it was fall, and. I was excited to patrol again and the snow and everything and I knew that patrol wasn't going to be enough for me to sustain myself so I figured out a way to bring honey from our northern New York yards to the Adirondacks um, and it's sort of like it's sort of difficult to make lots of honey in the Adirondacks so being able to provide this what I was talking about earlier just an awesome product to the people there and that medicine and um, just the ability to sustain myself as well. It all just came together and and was and was and it is still really great. So uh, that so with that I knew that I wanted to work five days plus in the bees and you know probably have my own garden but definitely want to be a beekeeper five days a week. So told Mike I wanted to be full time and found an apartment in Swanton, Vermont just in time for the global pandemic. <laughs> um, moved in in uh, end of March and um, yeah, built some shelves, canned some veggies and hoped for the best, still hoping for the best of course, um, but it's super cozy place, really gave me the ability to plan and, and create and I'm very grateful for it. Um, so, that so this summer I worked five days a week for Mike um, and I worked with my partner Adam who's on the left in the picture and he has 250 bee uh, colonies of his own so and then I also had my colonies in Adirondack so I worked seven days a week in the bees <laughs> basically and I loved every minute of it and I think that as a commercial beekeeper this is what you what you want to look for or maybe with everything like can I do this every day? You know, can I get through it every day? Do what? Do I love it every day? And and I do. And I think that's important. It's important for me, at least. Uh, I guess there's different priorities. So my priority is I love this every day. I want this every day. So um, by the end of this summer, I feel like I was finally getting a clue, really, uh, for the first time. And I'm still a I'm still definitely a beginner. 100%. Um, but I got stronger and I got a lot tougher and I began to do things that I wasn't able to do before, such as lifting the gate off of that truck behind me there, um, which is super difficult thing to do. And I still really can't do it. I'm too short. I'm just a short and small woman. Um, but that doesn't mean anything because I feel as though I've been able to overcome lots of those challenges that come along with being small in a manual labor field. Um, so now I feel this like actual reality in being able to look forward to my own queen rearing operation and potentially working with instrumental insemination and doing things scientifically and immersing myself as a woman in my field. Whereas in the beginning it felt a little, a little bit, a little bit out there for me. Like Kate and Takar are both taller than me and so I had all these um, 
you know, uh, um, insecurities about it. Like, am I ever going to be able to do this? And in fact, yes, I was able to do it. <laughs> so you can do it too. <laughs> in whatever you're doing, you can do it too. Um, and I realize now that it, the bees are a matriarchy. So men having their, their foot up here, it's only for now until the women realize that they were the ones that were supposed to be there. <laughs> I'm sort of kidding. <laughs> Um, so now that brings me to the beekeeper's year. Um, so I'm going to share with you about the year in Mike's beekeeping operation. Um, so first I would like to share with you some of my terms so that you understand the language going forward. Um, so first things first, the, this is a photo that I, uh, or, um, an image that I drew with my partner, Adam, and on the left, and this is a picture from the workshop that I gave to Arissa and that she asked me to come to this for. So I felt like it was nice to bring that all together. Um, on furthest left is a worker bee and she makes up the majority of the population in the colony. She's responsible for foraging, caring for the young, cleaning, building, building comb, uh, protecting because she is the, well, the, the other, the drone doesn't have a stinger and she does. And for ventilating and keeping the air moving and keeping it, you know, warm, cool, whatever the case may be, a regulated temperature. Furthest right is the drone. Uh, and he is solely responsible for reproduction and warmth, kind of, um, but mostly reproduction. Um, does not have a stinger and so is pretty useless in regards to protection other than maybe just like buzzing and scaring off predators that do know these come with stingers usually. Don't know what's up with this guy, but usually these come with stingers. <laughs> maybe I'll get out of here. <laughs> um, and then in the middle is the queen and she is responsible for reproduction. Uh, she lays somewhere around an average of 1500 eggs per day. That's 1,500 eggs per day. And she's also responsible for a chemical scent that is particular to the colony that she exists within. Um, and so going forward, this is a frame. And so the colonies that we work with have in the US and for the most part are movable frame hives. It's necessary for them to be movable frames because it gives you the ability to inspect them. And so you need to be able to look at the frames and see if there's disease, pests, um, and so that you're not spreading this. Uh, bees fly usually around two miles and land on flowers and trade whatever they've got going on with whatever, with other insects, um, including pollinators that, that are not honeybees. So it's important for us to be able to take care of and regulate diseases and viruses in the hive because if not you are directly responsible for the spread to to pollinators and that's and that's a terrible thing. So um, movable frame, easy to check, and the coat the comb is built into it. So there's this like wooden frame around the comb that makes it easy to lift out because then the comb, which is made of wax, if it's warm, it's inside of that frame. And so it doesn't, it doesn't like bulge out or move as you're pulling it. It just stays structured. Um, so here is what we call in Mike's operation, a production colony. Uh, a production colony is for honey production. So these are big brood nests and uh, they, the colonies get really big and full, and then they, they are driven to, with their big population, create, make lots of honey. Um, and so the, I'd like to define the difference between, in, in Mike's terms, a hive and a colony, because lots of people call them hives, and I call them colonies. So a hive is, is in direct reference to the the style of hive. So this is a Langstroth style hive, um, but inside of it is a colony of bees. So if you're referring to a colony of bees in a tree trunk, that's still a colony of bees. Uh, the tree trunk and the combs is the hive. 
where they live. So that is a beehive and inside it is the colony. Um, hopefully that makes sense. So this is a big one. So that Mike's production colonies are the two big boxes on the bottom and the little box on top. It can be arranged in any way, but those three boxes are the unit for production. That's like the base unit. So here's the bottom of one of those boxes. So as you can see, it sort of just creates this tube, sort of like a uh, tree trunk would, which is, a, I'm, I keep referencing tree trunk because that's the bee's um, preferred habitat is in a tree um, and so on. But um, so it basically, they're able to move freely through this, uh, through the, this unit to all of their areas, but you are able to separate and check, um, which I explain, has explained is important. And so it's also important for me to describe a nucleus colony. So a short, short for nucleus colony is nuke. And so a nuke is just a small colony that's created from a larger colony. And so this right here is a five frame nucleus colony. You can have four frame nucleus colonies, you can have three frame nucleus colonies, um, but basically it's just the right parts taken from a big colony and put into a little, made into a little one, and has a queen added to it. And um, there's one queen per colony. So that formula, you make this like tiny little unit. And uh, we use them a lot in our sustainability tactics. So that's what brings me to sustainability. Um, this is Mike, again, and he's my boss now. And his his beekeeping operation is entirely based on sustainability, uh, self-sustaining. And so what does that mean for us? I created a graph for that. Um, and this is the reason why I defined all these things. So overwintered nucleus colonies. So those, we make those little colonies, we build them up, make them a little bit stronger, get them through winter. And then here they are. So we go through them and we create nukes for sale. So we sell people little tiny colonies that they can grow into bigger colonies and um, replacements for winter losses. Um, so over the winter, you oftentimes, you know, especially with Varroa mite and other viruses and other um, pests and viruses that we're experiencing now, um, winter losses are higher than ever. The average loss is about 30%. Um, Mike, Mike is usually losing less because he is just an epic, epic beekeeper, which is why I love working for him. But um, it, that's a reality that we face. So we understand that when we have, when we go into winter, we will be experiencing loss. Um, so we raise colonies to replace them. So um, if you're a plant person, I like to compl compare bees to plants. They're very similar. Um, this is sort of like propagation. You take a little piece, you put it in the pot, you give it love, and then all of a sudden it explodes and it's this beautiful, big, blossomed plant. And all it came from is this tiny little piece from this other huge plant. How does that work? It's amazing. It's the same thing with the bees. You take this little piece and you put them in a box and you sell them to somebody who goes home and plants them in their yard and it grows into this awesome thing. And the same thing happens with um, the winter losses replacements. Um, and then that turns into money for the operation and honey in the production colonies. So from there we move into rearing queens, another important sustainability tactic. If you wanna be truly sustainable, you should raise your own queens. That's because once you raise them, you have queens, let's say you have 100 and you sell 50 of them, and they run about $30 a piece. And then you use the other 50 of them to make those little nucleus colonies because all of those nucleus colonies that you just made for replacements for your winter losses are just frames until of bees until they get that queen and then they become a colony. I hope that makes sense. It's difficult. It's a lot of um, like uh, theory and stuff. So, um, from there, same thing, money and honey. You've got the production colonies with the honey and that you can sell and then the money um, from the queens that you've sold. And so 
in the middle of the summer after raising queens or around the same time, you have nucleus colonies that have become too strong and colonies that have become too strong. And so instead of it, our tactics, in, instead of letting them swarm, there's de many schools of thought here. And I realize that, um, but that's too much to get into right now. Um, we take some of that strength away and make little colonies out of them. So more propagation, splitting the, splitting the plant. And so we take those little colonies, make, make, col make small colonies with the queens and uh, overwinter them. And that brings us all the way back up to those overwintered nucleus colonies. And then we go through again. And that's how we are, that's base, basic terms, how we are sustainable three of the ways. There's more to it than that, but these are the, the main hubs of sustainability in Mike's operation. So now we are in the first of the, the first of the beekeepers year, which is mid-March. <laughs> and we are opening the beehive to see, are they still alive? Are they okay? Do they need any food? And if they do, we give them some food. If not, we move on. And in April, we unwrap them. So they've been wrapped with uh, standard weight tar paper for solar gain because this black tar paper is wrapped tightly against the, the colony and it attracts the sunlight, which heats up the, the inside and the cluster, gives them some warmth. Um, with two entrances, you're really not doing much with insulation. Um, even if you wrapped the whole thing, leaving an entrance obviously lets in the cold. So um, we do, uh, oops, we do put a two inch piece of foam on top. Oh, I'll tell you about that later. So the next thing we do is um, create those cardboard nuke boxes because all of those become nucleus colonies for sale. Um, and so that's me behind a stack of those nuke boxes that I'm creating there. Um, and so that's just, a, it's a small box. You can fit four or five frames in them. And those are our little, those are our little like plant propagations that go out into the world. Um, and so from there, it becomes spring. It's, and so my um, vision of spring is when you see ramps uh, um, in the woods. Uh, they're like the forest onion and trillium, the flower behind them. So the ramps are the ones in the foreground with the like long and um, slender and, and uh, uh, lined leaf. And then in the back, the white flower with three leaves and three petals is trillium. And um, when you can see them in the woods, which is so easy to do here in this uh, hardwood forest, um, it's officially spring. And, uh, and, I, and you can't blink because if you do, it will be winter. <laughs> um, and so from here, we go immediately into the creation of those nukes, putting them into those white boxes for sale, and the creation of the winter replacements. Here, I'm zoomed in on the winter replacement. I'm creating in this picture one of those uh, winter replacements, and I like to call this up potting. Similar if you're like a plant lover, you've got this, this colony, it's busting at the seams, it's ready to be in a bigger place, it's ready for, um, to just live its best life <laughs> and get huge. And so we put it into, this bigger box um, with some empty frames and give it another box and we let it go. And um, this was my first experience this year, just this year doing this. And it was incredible. It's just like when you up pot a plant, you put that plant in the pot in the spring and you watch that thing go. And it's just amazing how they grow. And these, these colonies of bees, these new colonies that we up potted all made 80 pounds of honey. It was incredible. And I mean, just incredible. They, they did so well and they were, they were flourishing and healthy and happy. And it was an awesome thing to watch. Um, so the next thing we do is called reversing. I showed you this because when I first started at Mike's, I thought that this was like, as like, I could not understand any of these, any of these numbers at all. And now I know what they all mean. 
And, uh, and that was a huge challenge to overcome. I was like, I can't do this. What are you talking about? But um, it's all in regards to the strength of the colonies. So uh, reversing, you literally take the colony, remove the lid, take the entire colony and tip it back. And it's all glued together, right? Because bees, glue, they love gluing everything together. They use propolis, which is um, resin material from trees that they harvest and bring back for uh, an immune system for the colony. And they glue everything together with it. And um, you, so you lean the whole colony back, break it all apart and inspect it pretty thoroughly. You check for how strong they are um, and, uh, you know, what they're looking like, if there's any disease, you scrape the whole bottom board off of any debris that's left over um, that can totally be detrimental to them. So it's, I, I love this process. Some people don't do this, but I would definitely add this to the list of, of sustainability tactics because I'll go back to the previous picture quickly. Bees in the wintertime move up. So they start down in the bottom, like in that gray box, and then they move up to the blue box. So in the springtime, that bottom box is completely left empty. And so you're able to, in this time of reversing, not only clean up and get rid of old frames and replace and really check in on them um, for maybe the only time that year, you're also able to put that empty box on top. And so you give them space that is already there. You don't need to um, build more boxes or, um, or like, you know, it, it's there. The space is right underneath of them. It can be cleaned up by you, the beekeeper. You know, sometimes there's mold there and stuff because they're not near it. And so you can clean it up and then give them that space back and they'll clean it all out and make it beautiful and use it again and just keep using things. And so that's sustainable to me. Um, so, uh, so from there, after we reverse, um, so, so reversing is literally, like I just said, you're taking everything and you're switching it around so that the empty box is on top. We move quickly into supering. And one of Mike's, another one of Mike's sustainability tactics is to quit, um, supering is adding empty boxes to the top of the colony. Just so sort of reversing is like supering, but really supering is adding these mediums. So Sorry, I keep going back, but I'm excited. <laughs> um, as we talked about earlier, um, in, the, in the, the brood nest, there's those three boxes. So you can see the three boxes on the bottom, but then you see how there's three boxes on top of them. So those are supers. So we're giving them tons of extra space for which they can immediately start to pack honey when, when the forage, when the bloom starts to come on. And the first bloom here is like maple. They don't usually do much with that because it's too cold, but then we hit dandelion and they go crazy. And so if you are supering after or in the middle of dandelion, you are too late. You have to put the boxes on early. And that is one of the, the coolest things that Mike does is he's early and he's ahead of time with everything. And he's a true farmer in that way. And I love it. Um, so right after we super and you have like maybe one moment to take a breath before queen rearing begins. And this is my favorite part. So Mike is, in my opinion, one of the best in the world. <laughs> and um, I got to learn from him this summer, which, which um, was a wonderful experience. And so this is me and Kate this summer, um, Kate and I, <laughs> and uh, we are grafting here. And so basically um, when the egg when the queen lays the egg, the egg hatches and becomes a larva. And right in that time, right soon after it's hatched, you take that larva with a tiny little tool and you put it in a cup. And you do that a bunch of times with a bunch of different larvae and you make sure that you put it very carefully in the cup. And then those cups are on a, on a, on a uh, stick and they're placed into, the col into a very, very strong colony. Um, a colony that is without a queen. And so they're desperate. We're just an egg. We've taken everything out from them. So they don't, they just, they're looking everywhere. What can we do? We really want a queen. And you give them these perfect little larvae 
in their perfect little cups and they're like, awesome. <laughs> and they take off and they start building queen cells and they become these beautiful queen cells that look sort of like morel mushrooms somehow. Um, don't tell me that's not, uh, that's not uh, um, on purpose. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so they, they build all of these cells. And as you can see, th this is my first attempt at grafting and I missed one, two, three, four, five. Um, I missed five or six. Mike never misses any. He's amazing. He, he is like, and his cells are, are big and, and I aspire to be like him someday. So um, from there, those little cells get taken very carefully off of that frame and placed into, oh, I forgot. This is the inside of what one of them looks like. So this is a queen that didn't make it. You can see how she's kind of brownish in the chest. Um, we knew that by looking at the cell. So uh, you're able to like kind of tell, but it's really interesting to see this pupa stage um, queen. And so those little cells get placed into these tiny little nucleus colonies with little half frames. And they live in there for the rest of, rest of their time until they emerge. And they're taken care of by the, by the bee, by the little worker bees in there. And uh, she goes and takes off on her mating flight when, after she emerges. So she comes out, she runs around, acquaints herself with the, with the colony, and then leaves out her entrance and goes on a flight where she mates with 12 drones in the air, an average of 12 drones in the air. Um, they die in the process and she comes back to her exact entrance and begins to immediately start laying 1500 eggs per day, average of 1500 eggs per day. So we come back, we pay attention to timing with all this, come back, find her. If you can find her in here, that's extra points for you. I don't know what you get because it's just Zoom. I can't give out candy or anything or honey, <laughs> but, uh, She's in the bottom right corner and she has a, as you can see, this like shiny enlarged thorax, which is the second part of the bee, and an, an, an elongated abdomen, which is the third part of the bee. And, um, and the, she, this is a beautiful dark queen. So usually the darkness of them for us uh, indicates that the genetics are good for this area. We are looking for uh, a darker queen and that's called a carniolan. Um, which is kind of a side thing. Sorry about that. So we catch them. And like we talked about earlier, they either get sold to people that need queens from Mike Palmer, which is probably everyone, you know, Mike's queens are just the best. And we keep a lot of them and we turn them into nucleus colonies to overwinter, like we talked about earlier. So those colonies that were too strong that we took a little bit from, we took like a propagation from them. We add the queen to them and they become their own little colonies that we build up in overwinter. And so the other thing that we do with those queens is requeening. So as queens live, they usually live about two, three, sometimes four, maybe even five years, not usually in the commercial beekeeping world. Um, they start to fail. They're, you know, they, they run out of eggs, they're um, getting older, they're getting frayed. Sometimes the bees replace them, but if they don't, we replace them for the bees to keep our genetics clean. And as we advance, we, our genetics, um, we, we become better able to get rid of pests and disease and like eliminate certain things from our program. So we use this cage to introduce the queen to those failing queen colonies because those colonies are used to their queen. They love her and they like to do their own thing. So we have to make, um, we have to kind of manipulate them to get this process to work. So we put her in that cage very carefully and then put her into the colony for four days. And if we come back in four days, and she's laying eggs, they have accepted her. So we let her out and 
if it went well, she looks like this. As you can see, around her, those bees are facing her. And that means that she has a good retinue. That's what that's called, is a retinue. And um, she, uh, and they are taking care of her and feeding her and making sure that she's doing her best job in, in laying a 1,500 eggs per day. So, yay, she's been accepted. And now all of a sudden, it's harvest season. Um, so we go back around and remove all of those supers that we talked about earlier. Um, we carefully remove them. There's lots of different ways of doing that, but we put them all on that, that big one ton truck and carry them back to the shop. And they usually weigh, another thing that I had to, I had to get stronger because they usually weigh around 40 to 50 pounds each. And there's three to five of them on each colony, 20 colonies in each yard. We have about, uh, what, we have more than 20 yards. So you can do the math. That's a lot of, and then there's four of us working this summer. So I got some muscles. <laughs> so we bring them back to the shop and we um, scrape the wax capping off of the, the honeycomb. And we put them through an extractor, which is basically a big centrifuge. And this is a little one. This is actually Kate's little hand crank to frame. Um, and I use this to extract my honey. And wow, what a process it is to hand crank all your honey through an extractor. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. But uh, the Mike's big ones, Mike has a uh, 72 and 84, I'm pretty sure. Um, they have like an automatic button and they just spin all the honey out and it hits the walls and then slides down and out a pipe and that's it. Honey is just ready to go when it's, when it's out of the cappings. Um, and it's a pretty awesome thing. Um, yeah, the, you know, a little filtration to get rid of the bee parts if you want. But other than that, it's great. I, I just like mine straight up <laughs> personally. Um, yeah, so it's fall again. And it's time after harvest to just take a deep breath because that was a hot and heavy and rewarding couple of weeks, month really. And uh, you get to see all the honeys and you just get to enjoy the colors, which is a wonderful experience. And um, so with luck, we will wrap the colonies in that 15 pound tar paper before it snows. Uh, that's farmer's luck. Never, doesn't always work out that way. Um, and we add a two piece, two inch piece of uh, closed cell foam, like I was talking about earlier. Uh, I took this image from mudsongs.org, but the rest of the images are mine, just so you know. And um, so as you can see on the top, that piece of foam fits perfectly on the lid and that prevents condensation from happening. So because of the heat of the cluster and the cold of the outside, moisture happens scientifically and <laughs> it drips onto the cluster which freezes them so with that foam that prevents that from happening and we clean up the yards and make them all spiffy so that spring is an easy go for us and this is what it looks like and it's such a cute thing i think um we use the tar paper year after year uh i'm not sure how I feel about that, um, what I will do with my operation going forward. But as of right now, I feel pretty good about the tar paper because you can use it for a number of years. And it's like, with something that's going into the elements, what, di like, what product can be used like that doesn't eventually break down, you know? So some theory, theory there for you. Um, we package up, cut and package up our comb honey, one of my favorite, most relaxing jobs. We sell our honey uh, in market and give it as gifts. We stir it into immune system elixirs and, and hibernate our minds for the winter. And um, we often repair and replace the gear as needed in the workshop. Uh, and other than that, that's the year, that's like the basic year, quick and dirty year of beekeeping for you. Um, what do you need to be a beekeeper? So this is a little bee on board for you. 
Um, you need to be able to be stung. In this picture, I have four stings on one arm. So I embrace it. I feel it's an immune system booster for me. Um, I used to swell up like a balloon, like my friends that saw me would be worried for me. My hands looked like little, like weird blown up gloves or something. Um, but that went, the swelling went away for me. And I think it does for lots of people if they're stung consistently. Um, and I believe in bee venom therapy and I'm a huge, um, huge, I'm just a huge believer in bee venom therapy. So I embrace it. It hurts the same every time. So you have to be okay with it because it's going to happen. It's inevitable. Um, you can put on a suit, but likelihood is that you will create more of an allergy if you're not getting stung. You should get stung if you're a beekeeper. If they want to sting you and they want to let you know how they're feeling and they're not feeling right about you doing what you're doing, they should be able to let you know. Um, that's my personal opinion. So you need to be okay with physical manual labor. Um, like I said, those boxes are super heavy and that doesn't even hold a candle to how heavy it is to move a hive. Let's say a landowner decides they don't want your bees there anymore and they all weigh 200 pounds. You're lifting half of a 200 pound colony with someone else. And that's just the way of it. It's a heavy, heavy job. And it's very mentally demanding as well because there's so many little tiny pieces and parts and you should be um, involved in that mentally and caring for them because they're a living creature. You have to be able to deal with insects and arachnids and mice and bats. Uh, you find all these things under the lids and you see them all the time, little families of mice. Um, one of these, Wood spider, wolf spider? Unsure, wood spider, wolf spider. I have different, uh, everybody has a different idea which one this is. Um, but there's one of these almost under every lid and it is huge. <laughs> and I am a, a spider fearer, but I have gotten over my fear of spiders since, not gotten over entirely, but I've gotten past it quite a bit. I've gotten a lot better. Um, but you have to deal with them. So inevitable, again. You have to be able to study. Because, like I said, this is a living creature. You're in care of them. When they need you, they need you. It's just like your cat or your dog or yourself. If they need something, you are responsible for their life. So going into this, studying and understanding them, I think, like I said, all the way at the beginning, spending a couple of years just doing that was a huge benefit for me because now I feel like I have this um, advantage with that. So what you get, we'll be on some nasturtium there for you. <laughs> you get my favorite part, which is why I'm describing it first, is the presence. So in the age of screen and phone in your hand all the time, you are leaving all of that behind um, when you're with the bees, especially in commercial beekeeping because you're working with four people you all have colonies open at once, or more people. Everyone has a colony open. The colonies aren't happy. They don't wanna be dealing with you. So you are focused on what you're doing. And at the end of the day, you, you realize, wow, I've basically just meditated all day. You know, I just spent the whole day completely focused on what I'm doing and what a gift that is because it's a rarity, I feel, um, going forward with, with technology to be able to invest yourself mentally in just one thing. Um, I also feel this utmost reverence for them as a creature and, and care and understanding of when you move and how you move. And, and if you're passing your hand over top of them and casting a shadow, you feel them come up to you. How do you change your movements to adapt to them? And it's a lesson in life, I think, because it's how we can interact with each other with caring for each other, understanding another person instead of just taking your own needs and stomping them out. Just a thought. Um, fresh air, vitamin D, relationship with plants, all wonderful things. I love them. Uh, and I love that symbiotic relationship. Um, exercise. Uh, the, the style of beekeeping that we do is artisanal. Uh, it's all by hand other than that um, 
forklift we have in the dooryard. We do everything by hand. We move all the boxes by hand. So it's this, uh, it's this hard work, use your legs to lift type of style of, of work. And I, um, I appreciate it because I've, I've lost weight and I feel good and I feel empowered in my body to be able to do these things. Um, and if you're interested, here's a quick list. Daydance First Lessons in Beekeeping, first book, good book. FranchiliBeers.com, Mike's website. All of his YouTube videos are listed there. Huge, wonderful resource. Um, so those are two things on beekeeping. Bee behavior. If you're like one of those people like me that got a cat and like read a book about how cats behave, um, you will love Tom Seeley. Tom Seeley wrote, uh, I think five books on bee behavior and his studies out of Cornell University in bee behavior. Absolutely fascinating, wonderful work. Um, from there, Randy Oliver uh, is scientificbeekeeping.com. He's always conducting amazing scientific studies. Uh, he, his recent videos are super fascinating about treatments and, um, and uh, pollen sub and, and stuff like this. So if you're interested in like the scientific and, and, um, and doing uh, tests, definitely check out Randy. Megan Milbrath is an awesome resource for understanding Varroa. Her website, sandhillbees.com, gives you the ability to look at pictures of Varroa affecting a colony. And um, I was actually able to better identify Varroa after studying her work. Dr. Samuel Ramsey, if you're interested in Varroa, is a Varroa mite. Um, he, he specifically studies the Varroa mite. So an interesting uh, way to look at it from a different perspective is by looking at the pest that affects the bee. And I've learned so much from Sam Ramsey. He is, he is incredible. He's a wonderful, wonderful teacher. Um, similarly to everyone else I listed, all of these people just, they speak and their, their way of teaching just really resonates with, with so many people and they're incredible. Um, similarly to how I did, I, I recommend that you get involved with your local club. It's an opportunity to have a community of people who also care about the outdoors. You'll learn about plants from them. They'll give you jelly. It's awesome. <laughs> um, and then join your local pollinator protection organization and care for other pollinators. Um, so here's some ways that you can help the bees if you're not into getting stung or whatever, if you hate spiders. <laughs> um, you can plant bee-friendly plants. Here's some echinacea and globe thistle, two well-loved by many different pollinators. Um, echinacea is also great for us, so do yourself a favor, do the bees a favor, and plant some, um, some herbs for yourself in a planter box or in your yard. Um, get rid of the grass and just go go full flower. I highly recommend it. It's super uplifting. <laughs> um, don't mow. <clears throat> if, you, if you have a field or you don't know, like a lot of people I, I talk to say, I don't know when to mow. What do I do? Mow in the fall. So you, you have a meadow. You don't want it to become woody. <clears throat> mow in the fall. Wait until the last bloom goes. Goldenrod goes to rest. Um, all the pollinators go to rest and then run your, your mower through and you're, you're accomplishing the best of both worlds. And you're putting all those wildflowers back to seed in their space. Um, great, great way to do it. If you need to mow because you're, you're a lawn lover, I don't understand that, but I, I do know that you're out there and that's okay. Um, please wait to mow until after dandelion is gone. Because <clears throat> dandelion is the first huge bloom that comes in, and it is so, so vital to all pollinators it, in, in the Northeast. I know that, um, that it must be different everywhere else, so I'm, I apologize to those of you that might be tuning in from elsewhere. But if you're one of my friends um, from the Northeast, the dandelion is so important. It is, it is absolute source of um, vitality for the for all pollinators in the spring when there's nothing else um, available for them. And then after dandelion goes, there's nothing available for quite a while. So 
if you want to mow, wait until dandelion goes into that awesome seed stage of the wispy, um, wish blowing beauty and mow then. And give the dandelions the chance. Um, they're beautiful and they're also medicinal, edible in every part, root, leaf, stem, flower. And uh, I highly recommend throwing them on your salads, in your salads, eating the root, making some tea, all of the above. Um, regards to, this is a puffball mushroom, two of them. They're awesome. Also delicious. Um, but yeah, don't, don't over harvest anything, you know, sustainability. Can't, don't over harvest. <laughs> um, leave two thirds. That's the rule. Uh, same with the ramps, by the way. Um, limit and understand your use of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides. So why is this important? Um, it's obvious. These are chemicals. Please be careful with your use of them. I understand that it's super, uh, it's a, it's a necessary evil at times. There are, uh, less effective, um, not less effective, but less affected, uh, um, ways to do it. Um, and you can use, uh, if you are using, some people think, oh, uh, it's just a fungicide that won't affect pollinators. Not necessarily. There's lots of studies out that say that pollinators fun function symbiotically with mushrooms and mycelium. So as we kill mushrooms and funguses, we don't, un don't totally realize just how much effect we could have on them. And the last thing I would like for you to do is to boycott adulterated honey because a honey adulteration is a real thing. It's happening everywhere. Um, it means that the honey is mixed with uh, other honeys from elsewhere or with things that aren't even honey, like corn syrup, rice syrup, or made from those things by feeding the bees them. And all you need to do is buy from, your, from a beekeeper that you know or from a, a source that is local and pay attention to the labels. You can go to the, the Hannaford or whatever right now and look at the back of the honeys we've been doing it lately. And it says on the front, local, local source. And this is in Vermont. Local source honey, New Hampshire, Ben's honey. And then you turn it around, packaged in New Hampshire, honey from Argentina. I'm not saying anything bad about honey from Argentina. I'm just saying, don't call yourself local if you're not. <laughs> so pay attention to the label as a consumer something you can do super important to the beekeepers. And thanks. Um, if you have any questions, please email me or message me on my Instagram. And uh, I love talking about all things theory, uh, philosophy, and bees, of course, always. Um, and thank you so much again for listening and for, for giving me your presence. It's super important to me. Thank you so much, Bianca. This was amazing. Um, you're so articulate um, with the describing the symbiotic relationships and the, the analogy to plants. And it's all just um, so fascinating. So thank you so much for, for that wonderful presentation. I know there's probably a lot of questions that people have. So I'd love to open the floor to anyone who has a question. I know there's one in the chat here um, from John just to ask about um, historically some of the background with beekeeping if you had any insight on um, when it got started or that sort of thing. Um, um, I so there's like I just googled it really quick to check exactly how long ago it was but and it says 9,000 years ago. Um, I do know that they've found 